in Serial Killers, I used a Whole Foods high-fat diet to hack my genes in a quest for better health. This time, we're moving into the world of elite athletic performance. For 40 years since the concept of carbohydrate loading was developed in Scandinavia, the research was done starting actually in the 1930s in Denmark, but the Swedes after in the 1960s and 70s did superb research showing that you need carbs to do high intensity performance. We've all been pushing this uh, high carbohydrate line for 20, 30 years and uh, no one's ever really questioned it. You might have the magic ingredient was you had to do the carbohydrate loading diet and then you also had to try and do 100 miles a week. That was the magic thing, 160 k's a week and you were you know, then sort of into world-class training. I was eating extremely low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet for 15 plus years and I thought that's the healthiest and the highest performance way of eating. Well, I was doing pretty well in sports but I basically became pre-diabetic. We now understand the limitations of low-fat, fat-free diets, that they're not necessarily healthy at all. Many athletes are doing this, quote, in the closet because they don't want to have to explain to people why they're doing something that, that almost all professional nutritionists tell them is wrong. And the second reason is if a competitive athlete is doing this and is getting really good results, and there are many who have, they're not about to give away their advantage to their competitors because this is uh, something that, that is uh, giving them an edge in winning. Sammy Inkinen is a World Ironman champion. He's fueled by Whole Foods, he's a fat adapted athlete, and we're here to tell his story. The catalyst for me to explore a lower carbohydrate diet, or at least start paying attention to the mountains of processed carbohydrates that I was eating, uh, was twofold. First, uh, I think it was 2009, I was tested at Stanford to see whether I burn fat or carbohydrates for fuel when I'm exercising. What they found out was I was a highly efficient sugar burning machine, uh, which is okay if you're racing one hour or maybe up to two hours, but anything longer and you quickly run out of fuel, glycogen, carbohydrates. Uh, so that was the first catalyst for me, just for performance reasons. The second motivation for me to really pay attention to the mountains of carbohydrates that I was eating was really for health reasons. Um, this was a couple of years ago, I realized my fasting blood glucose values were actually pre-diabetic. And I also started reading much more books about the effects of sugar and processed carbohydrates in our diet, on our health. And the more I started reading, I realized that maybe the low-fat, or in my case, almost zero-fat diet isn't the healthiest way to live. And then gradually, I totally changed my diet and the way I eat. Do you want eggs? Uh, eggs and spinach and then avocado. Oh, you got guacamole. Nice. We typically do our morning workout pretty much in a fasted state. Maybe have a cup of coffee, maybe a little bit of dark chocolate in Definitely there. Definitely have a cup Basically, of coffee. no food before, um, before we go running or whatever exercise we might do. When I first met Sami, I was a strict raw foodist and I was a raw foodist with him uh, until I got into cycling. And Sami had convinced me that if I was cycling with him that I needed to be eating lots of oatmeal and sports gels or else I would bonk. I would hear it quite often. He would be nagging me like, you need to have something to eat. You need to eat some oatmeal or you need to have a gel. You're going to bonk. And so I got totally guilt tripped into eating that way. And from the minute I was eating the gels or the oatmeal, I would feel terrible. And I would always tell him, like, if he had me carb load for a race or something, I'd be like, I feel so terrible. I'm never doing this again. And then he would convince me the next time I needed to do it. And, yeah, it, that went on for a couple of years. <laughs> Here's a pretty much a typical uh, post-endurance workout meal. Real whole foods. This is a lot of eggs and spinach. People often think that if you work out one, two, three hours a day that you have to be 
sort of carb loading after your workout, but if you're well fat adapted, you know, this is the kind of diet we follow and haven't had any issues in working out day after day and even doing some high intensity workouts. Sammy Inkinen adopted the principles of Steve Finney, the author of The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance and one of the most controversial voices in the world of nutrition. My peers think that I'm a heretic. They can't understand why I would persist in uh, standing by data that is so contrary to what everybody wants to believe. I feel uh, very sorry for Steve Finney, who's been a a pioneer who's really been ahead of his time and has not got the recognition that he deserves. And, uh, you know, as it turns out, he's been right for 30 years and the rest of the world has been wrong. Steve Finney's never really told me the problems he went through and with Westman and Jeff Ehrlich. They were the real pioneers and they just had to take it on the chin. And that took great courage. My focus on low carbohydrate diets actually happened in a backwards way. I came in through the back door. And that was because as an endurance cyclist back in the 1960s, I had learned that I had to eat a lot of carbs if I wanted to do any ride longer than an hour or two. But during my medical residency, I was having a discussion with one of my attending physicians, a guy who eventually became my mentor. And he was saying that some people had been following the Atkins diet that he knew who said that they really weren't impaired physically, that they could do you know, the normal daily jobs and activities without significant impairment. Uh, and I thought that was completely bogus. So we decided to do a research project. I set out to prove him wrong. I ended up proving myself wrong. We published that paper in 1980. That was on untrained people. And then we did a study with athletes who really could give us a, a reproducible endurance performance to exhaustion. And again, found that if you only went a week on a low-carb diet, significant reduction in performance. But if you went four to six weeks, people came back to or above where they'd been before. So there was clearly a delay. It takes at least a few weeks for the body to make the adjustment from high carb to low carb. But almost everybody can, and when people do, they find this enabling because they no longer have to eat when they go out and do endurance, uh, hard work or sport. It was not what I expected to see. Um, but it was the data, and that's what I've been following since. The title of my talk might be a little confusing because I talk about nutritional ketosis. You may not have heard that term. Um, As you know, I've published a lot of scientific term. papers. But there really are no textbooks on low carb available, or had been no textbooks. There were popular books, oftentimes written by non-scientists. Mm -hmm. So what my co-author and I, Jeff Bullock and I, decided to do was to, um, first we decided to write this book, which was written as a, basically a textbook for healthcare providers. Um, physicians, nurses, dietitians about low carb. So when we did that, a bunch of athletes contacted us and said, you know, we're using the low carb diet, but we need more information. And can you provide us some information on low carb diets for athletes? And we said, okay. <laughs> we ended up writing this book, provide specific information about the low carb fueling strategy um, and how to be able to use this uh, in not just for improving health, but also improving certain types of function. The weather continues to be mild, but a warming trend is expected by this weekend. The stock market now closed down today with light trees. I'm on my way to see Dr. Steve Finnip. Uh, Steve's been extremely helpful in advising us about our expedition diet and how we can perform or complete the kind of endurance feast that we are about to do. We're going to row across the Pacific Ocean, 2,400 miles, unsupported from California to Hawaii. And we're doing it to raise awareness about the dangers of sugar and processed carbohydrates. So no gels, no sports drinks, no candy or candy bars. Only real whole foods, high fat, low carbohydrate and moderate protein. And the amount of work that we'll be doing for about two months is about the same as running two marathons each day by each of us. We're also trying to prove that you could stay married doing something like this. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Hi, Sammy. Steve, how are you? Good, Good to see, to see you see again. You. Yeah, likewise. Come on in. They're going where no man and woman have gone before. I'm not aware of anyone who's done that kind of prolonged event, 45 to 60 days of continuous physical activity on a low-carb diet where it's been recorded. A marathon a day for five days is the longest sustained 
event that I've heard of with low carb. Um, so, you know, Sami and Meredith are just going to you know, increase that by a factor of 10, <laughs> 50 plus days. We're going to try to be very careful about what we say out loud to each other. The mantra that we try to follow is random acts of kindness. So whenever you feel bad, think about the other person yeah. as opposed to your own pain. And if you then act and do little things that actually make the other person feel better, hopefully that's uh, a very good preventative measure. Yeah. But we uh, try to anticipate the issues that we have and in fact create a almost like a conversation manual where we have responses to specific questions. Yeah. One of us will cook. Probably me. I think we'll just do it once a day. We wanted to do this expedition as an example to people that not only can you live your normal everyday life eating whole foods and without sugars and processed carbohydrates, but you can do a huge expedition like what we're doing, just eating whole foods and none of the packaged processed carbohydrates and sugars. My food is it's basically like one giant package of dehydrated vegetables that I'll add water to. Um, and then a bunch of like nuts and dried fruit and olives and salmon. And then Sami has these extra calories that are basically just nuts and 100% um, chocolate. We have about almost a million calories of food in total. Um, I packed about 8,000 calories for each day and Meredith, since she's smaller, she has about 5,000 calories for each day. And they are in about 1,500 to 2,000 calorie pack, so we know how many meals we should have each day and how many calories we've had by, by dinner time. I don't really have a philosophical reason why I don't eat red meat or white meat, but I felt better when I started eating salmon and fish because I was a raw foodist for quite a long time and I didn't touch meat at all. Um, but I was able to put on a lot more like muscle mass when I started eating fish. And it has like a pretty good macronutrient balance for us. Like there's good fats. We are all taking omega-3 supplements and anyway, so I'd rather have it in the food. I'm a total sucker for numbers and statistics. So I, I have everything documented. So in terms of um, uh, my food breakdown, 76% of my calories come from fat, 15% um, come from protein, and only 9% of calories come from carbohydrates. And all of those calories are from real whole foods, mostly from nuts, dehydrated vegetables, um, and then a little bit from the unsweetened dark chocolate. One of the, the, the key issues that Sami has been focused on is how to train his body to use primarily fat. And so the, the key factor that he's been uh, working towards is determining how much of his work intensity when rowing day in and day out, how much of that fuel can come directly from fat. And as you can see from his own records, he's been remarkably compulsive about getting his you know, personal data. Yeah, I've had uh, blood taken every six months or so, and I've seen a lot of changes over the years, uh, less inflammation, and then uh, blood glucose levels are much more stable and lower at the healthier level. This very low fat oxidation curve here is at different intensities of exercise. And you can see that this was back in 2009, where he, he was on a high-carb diet and burned very little fat. The same exercise a couple years later when he had gone to a, a moderate fat at three months on the, on the high-fat diet. You can see it's uh, much improved in terms of the rate of fat oxidation come way up. But then, just this month, when he repeated the test, now he's been on low carb for well over a year, you can see that he's had further market improvement. And at his rate of fuel expenditure, in the, the probably out here in the 200 watts of power output range, he's still close to 75, 80% of his energy coming from fat. And to put that in perspective, 200 watts of output is pretty heavy going. That's most normal mortals would find 200 watts would be something they'd quit within half an hour or less. We put Sami through a number of our assessment tests, and he performed incredibly well, not only for an endurance athlete, but for some of our more seasoned athletes right out of the gate. He's really well adapted. He has a great uh, metabolic engine, so to speak, with a low heart rate using uh, the fat as fuel. My ability to burn fat 
has tripled. So it's a 200% increase from about 200 calories an hour to more than 700 calories. Is that an exact science, Steve? I mean, can you determine for Sammy and Meredith exactly what their macronutrient breakdown must be and prepare a really specific food plan for the road? We can estimate what Sammy's needs are, and he's measured his needs um, by rowing and riding a cycle in the lab to check on, on fuel requirements. But those are you know, studies that lasted less than a day. Uh, we don't know how his body's going to respond 10 days out, 20 days out, 30 days out. Um, we do know that the human is remarkably capable of adapting to changes in nutrient intake. And that's why the low-carb diet works at all, is because people can switch from burning primarily sugar in their body to burning primarily fat. So we can have a high degree of confidence that this will work. But can I guarantee you that we know precisely what it is they, they need uh, or what's the optimum? Um, we don't know. I'm somehow trying to squeeze all these 60 packs in here, which uh, it's not looking too good, but I'm trying my best. The most recent test results that I got, it seems that I'm burning a good 80% of calories coming from body fat and about 20% comes from carbohydrates and that 20% is about 150 calories per hour mm. um, but the food that we packed is only about 50 calories per rowing hour so I was basically concerned that are we going to bonk in the middle of the Pacific with this low carbohydrate diet yeah, and, and that's a, a really valid concern. Asami's not eating a high protein diet, he's eating a moderate protein diet. Only about 20% of his calories come from protein but when you're in this range of fat oxidation up here, that instrument makes protein oxidation look like carbohydrate oxidation. So Sami thinks he needs a little bit more carb than I think he really does. This is a nuanced point that many people in the sports nutrition field ignore. Yep. And that is, these are some data from a faster study that Jeff Volek is doing at the University of Connecticut. This test normally ignores the protein. Mm -hmm. But your body isn't ignoring the protein you're eating. You're eating about 20% mm -hmm. of your calories per day mm -hmm. is protein. Uh, and that's going to end up skewing your data because some of that protein being oxidized is going to look like carbohydrate and it's going to make the carbohydrate numbers here look bigger. I see. But over the course of a few days, your body will adapt. And as long as you get enough fuel and you get enough minerals uh, to meet your your ongoing needs, as you noted, you're going to have sweat losses and you have to yes. replace those mineral losses in sweat. Oh, so I think you can be very confident you're not going to hit the wall or bonk out in the Pacific uh, and you'll uh, probably within three days be fully adapted oh, to your see. diet. I see. So that, that's good news. We don't have to pack 100 pounds of sugar as a additional <laughs> performance fuel. Yeah, as you know, if you eat sugar and then you exercise for more than an hour or two, you're going to bonk unless you eat more yes. sugar. It's a, yes. it's a vicious cycle. Yes. So not bringing it with you is going to give you the, the fastest adaptation I and see. hopefully give you the fastest time from here to Honolulu. Fantastic. That's exciting. Yeah. I think it's great. This is going to be the last night that we eat truly fresh food. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. After this many months of like prep work and waiting, I'm just ready to go. This is a truly bold endeavor on their part and has the potential to advance our knowledge about this a great deal. So there's not just you know, the personal um, opportunity to triumph in this case, but there's an opportunity to do some really interesting scientific observation as well. Is this the greatest keto adapted endurance experiment that you've seen in modern times? Um, simple answer to that is absolutely yes. Back at the Sports Science Institute of South Africa, it's almost two and a half years since we met Professor Tim Noakes in Serial Killers 1. He's had a remarkable impact on the city of Cape Town and the country of South Africa. 
in that time and in fact he's become one of the leading authorities worldwide in the push for whole foods, high fat diets as they relate to both health and increasingly performance. Well my life has turned around in many ways. The big change was that we published The Real Meal Revolution in November last year and it just went off and it, it became a phenomenon by itself and to date it sold in excess of 130,000 copies. The other advance is we formed the Noakes Foundation and the goal of the Noakes Foundation is to give out 2 million rand a year in perpetuity for research on low carbohydrate diets and, and all the proceeds from Real Meal Revolution go to that and we should in a period of 5 or 10 years be able to answer many of the important questions. Our science has taken off. We've done a couple of studies. We have a study coming out in Canada showing that people on this diet reduce the metabolic syndrome from 80% of the particular general practitioner's practice down to 20% in eight months. And we finished our first study of athletes adapted to high fat or high carbohydrate diets. The next study we want to do is to take fat runners who are running comrades marathons and marathons or cycling and they're fat and that's the paradox how can you be fat when you're doing so much training and the argument is that they'll be insulin resistant right, so it's our fourth day Mary's writing our first uh, blog update and I'm just trying to recover a little bit our drove because the waves were just way too big and we started feeling quite squared 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 <laughs> and it couldn't really roll uh, certainly not in the side wind and even tail wind uh, water from here <laughs> otherwise uh, feeling pretty good and uh, stinky <laughs> <laughs> he's living up to his name thinking <laughs> Yeah, we're going to light the barbecue and cook some meat, but the intriguing thing is that I'm using real charcoal here, um, and I light it with twigs from the trees here, and the twigs act as a quick start, and burn very hot, and this is kind of like sugar in the body, that it burns really hot, but if you watch, this will all be gone in about four or five minutes, but once we get the charcoal started, It'll burn for an hour or more. So the twigs are like carbs. They burn hot, but they have relatively uh, little energy. And so they're gone within about five minutes. But the charcoal, once it gets started, has a lot of energy in it and it burns very slowly. And that's more like the body's fat supply. Uh, so it's just the charcoal is a long lasting fuel. The twigs of carbs are the short, quick energy fuel. Many of the benefits of being on low carb is because the body switches to using not just fat, but also these chemicals called ketones. Ketones are a naturally occurring chemical which our body makes as an alternative to blood sugar. In somebody who eats a low carb diet, the body takes fat from its energy stores turns it into ketones in the liver and circulates those through the blood and they have equal status to blood sugar as a fuel for the body, for the muscles, for the brain, uh, pretty much any tissue in the body. The critique is that it's, it's an unhealthy form of fuel supply to working muscles and I don't think that has now remotely been proven that it's anything but a good healthy approach and the the data comes from Ironman it comes from world triathlon events and what struck me from looking at the cardiological literature was that in events such as Ironman that there is a fairly large proportion of world-class athletes who damage their hearts during uh, these ultra distance events and the way the the damage is quantified is through uh, heart muscle protein release into the circulation and direct measure using echocardiography which is an imaging technique that we use to evaluate heart function and the theory is that it may well be based 
on the differences in nutrition in supplying energy to the heart muscle. And it is a fact that our heart muscle is far more efficient at utilizing ketones as a fuel and glucose as a fuel. Everything's going pretty well. Um, food plan is working pretty well in that we haven't really eaten much, probably less than half of what we burned. But we both had very good energy, feeling good, not hungry. The biggest challenge so far really has been the weather. We're heading south and we're both rowing up to 14 hours today. Taurus Andy Moore in his first possession and the ball goes astray it was intended for Colin Boyle but it breaks down and there's a chance and there might still be a chance and there finally is and it's put over the bar and it's the captain Andy Moran. Well, I eat three hours prior to a game because it will, you'd be too full and at this at this stage I can I, if I eat my if I eat a good breakfast um, with, with a lot of fat sources I feel the energy I have during the day I can eat less which which allows me to eat closer to a game. What I've settled on really is between 50 grams to 150 grams of, of carbohydrate prior to a game. There's been no loss of power really and uh, my aerobic capacity during the National League has uh, certainly improved. Two defenders helped out here by Andy Moran. Moran looking dangerous. Opportunity here for Killian O'Connor, well blocked down. Taken out by Philly McMahon. The interesting thing is that there seems to be a movement among the Australian football. There are a number of the top players who are uh, adopting this. And the ball is handled on the ground. I thought that attack should have got, if it mounted to more. Just watch. In uh, my own sport, cricket at the moment, we have a number of the Australian players who seem to have really gained benefit from uh, this low-carb, high-fat diet. I've increased um, my, my energy. Uh, it's helped me recover better. And I feel that I've got more to give and I can push myself extra and I think it's helped me mentally with my game. I feel like I'm at the exact same athletic level than what I was on my previous diet, but to be able to maintain my weight, which has always been a really big problem for me, especially in the last four or five years, when I've had to cut back the amount that I've trained because I used to overtrain a lot, which meant I was actually getting injured a lot more because I was going into games fatigue, whereas now I've cut back the amount that I train, so um, this is change my life for forever. One of the interesting aspects of this diet is the anti-inflammatory effect and obviously we have long-term effects of, of inflammation that can slow down uh, athletes and be, even be career-ending. The benefits of reducing uh, inflammation in your body is primarily recovery and recovery is the big word in sports performance at the moment, particularly in team sports. We put a lot of effort into aiding recovery from one extreme exertion, say a game of some sort, to be able to recover as quickly as possible so that you can get quality training in before the next game. So if we can reduce the amount of inflammation in response to exercise, we're going to improve recovery and therefore improve performance. I'd like to try to uh, destroy a few myths here. I'm going to take some really old data this from before any of us were born, including me. Um, Steve Finney's work has clearly shown that this diet is anti-inflammatory and ketosis by itself is also anti-inflammatory. And I think that's the way the future work is going to go. All the discussion about what diet you should be eating focuses on acute performance in one race. And it completely fails to address long-term health consequences and how quickly you recover and how easy it is to control weight. On the basis of laboratory studies, which, which I've torn out here, and those laboratory studies only address human performance in terms of endurance or sprinting activity. We've got nothing else about recovery or long-term survival in the sport. So there's a massive need for long-term studies of this diet and how athletes using this diet benefit in terms of their life careers. The thing that we've discovered is not only does good cholesterol go up, not only does saturated fat in the blood go down, but many things that we can test in the blood that indicate the body's level of inflammation, those also, when you get the low-carb diet right, those biomarkers of inflammation go down. And we now know, just in the last 15 years, you know, it's become recognized fact that those biomarkers of inflammation are potently connected, not just to whether or not you develop type 2 diabetes or whether you have a heart attack, 
but they're also now potently linked to many common forms of cancer and to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so what's, <laughs> what's there not to like about having biomarkers of inflammation come down? But you know, we didn't have that information even 10 years ago. And now that we have that, we can again say this is a diet that can be safely followed, not just for a month or two to lose weight, as it was kind of typically used in the past, but it can be used for decades with a high likelihood of much better health as a result of cutting out those carbs that some of our bodies just don't tolerate. I think we are as close to bonk proof as you can get. You can produce a bonk by sprinting until you bonk, but the kind of work that we are doing uh, 12 hours a day at that effort and with the kind of diet that we've been following, we are as bonk proof as it gets. <laughs> When you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you need uh, to fuel your brain and your muscles from carbohydrate. And the two compete. And so when you run out of fuel, the thing we call hitting the wall, some people call it bonking, is that the brain and the muscles are competing for disappearing fuel. And when the brain has, doesn't have enough energy, the lights go out. Not a fun thing to have happen. When you adapt to low carb, what you do is you allow the, the brain and the muscles to function off fat, which the body has much, much more of. That then uh, supports the surprising performance capability that uh, low carb adapted athletes have. Tim Olson had run this, this distance in a little under 15 hours. He ran 100 miles on trails. And not only did he win the race, he was 15 minutes ahead of his nearest competitor and he beat the course record by 20 minutes. And a year ago, this runner switched to a low-carb fueling strategy. Is he a fluke? Well, here's a guy named Zach Bitter. He's running just 50 miles in this race uh, in the Midwest. And again, he's switched to a low-carb from a high-carb fueling strategy within the last year. And he came within two minutes of breaking the all-time course record in this race. So there are some people out there who are doing remarkable things with low-carb, proving that you don't need carbs to do remarkable amounts of physical performance. I'm so freaking tired, so I need a break. I don't know why I'm so tired right now. It's the second or third day that I'm feeling pretty fatigued. So I'm gonna do a strategic break and then go back to Ors. I'm really still going strong. Second 35 minutes from the St. Vincent's player. The game against Dublin at Crow Park, I, mean, I was in the game, I was playing well, and uh, I suppose just at 64 minutes, which is a vital time of the game, I, I got severe cramp in both calves. Crampy does seem to be the one negative uh, associated with this low carb, high fat diet. I think there are a couple of issues there. I think salt is an issue. Um, I think because we're so used to having uh, salt in processed food, we unknowingly get quite a high salt intake. And uh, I'm now adding salt to my food, which you know has always been a big no-no, you know, about uh, concerns about blood pressure and so on. But if you're not eating salty processed food, then you're probably not getting enough salt. So up the salt and also magnesium. There seems to be some evidence that low magnesium might be associated with this low carb, high fat diet. Through help, through uh, I suppose Ben Greenfield and Tim Noakes yourself, um, I've went into the magnesium salts baths, magnesium spray for my legs, and uh, just a little magnesium supplement to, to, to keep me going during the games, and uh, it's re it, it's really helped. And James McCarthy played back in here once again to Andy Moore, and can he finish? Yes, he can. Lovely score by Andy Moore. And uh, if you don't have enough magnesium in your body, then kidneys can't manage salt and potassium well. So. Oftentimes people say, well, it's potassium or it's sodium, but the hidden culprit, you know, kind of behind the scenes is magnesium. And the place you get magnesium is from leafy greens, which I can eat, whole grains, which I can't eat, but, you know, processed white flour is almost completely devoid of magnesium. So when you process natural grains into um, white flour, uh, you take away al almost all the magnesium, even if it says it has whole wheat in it. Again, most of that's taken out. And the other place you get magnesium is from meat. 
because it's in muscle for a purpose. And if you eat the muscle, that you get meat there. If you make broth from, say, leftovers, I can buy the whole chicken, cut off the pieces I want, and then use the carcass to make broth. And that broth is a principal part of, of my diet uh, because that's way, one of the places I get magnesium because I don't get it from whole grains. When you give magnesium, there's a supplement. Because if you give it in a form that um, you know, hits the stomach right away, uh, it can cause uh, significant problems with because it's a laxative. So people have diarrhea and um, uh, stomach upset. So I use a generic version of a slow-release magnesium. You take, just take three of these pills of potassium pills per day, and because it's slow-release, you can take them all at once, and it doesn't cause any change in digestive function, and it's well-absorbed. And this is like a $6 solution. You, know, you don't have to pay megabucks. This is, this is super inexpensive. Day number 33 in the open ocean, and I think it's day number 33 when I'm having the same lunch. And to celebrate, we have some sunshine for the first day, and I had the most amazing thing that I've been fantasizing about for weeks, which was that I had a hair wash courtesy of Mr. Inkin. So now I'm quasi-clean, and we're enjoying lunch and celebrating one day of sun. One day. Bye-bye. I got interested in low carb initially because I wanted to use it in the short term for weight loss in, with people. Um, but as we realized eventually that some people could go on low carb and get better, but when we took them off of low carb, they went back having the same old problems. And then the question that came, could people stay on low carb long term? And so I became very curious in the history of peoples who lived in places where there weren't carbs. Like the Inuit people who lived in the Arctic uh, didn't have sources of grains, didn't have any significant fruits to speak of, and their summer was only about three months long. So for the rest of the year, nine months, they were living on ice and snow. And so I read uh, the writings of quite a few Arctic explorers. And what that led me to understand was first, these people did not eat a high protein diet. They ate a high fat diet and only moderate levels of protein. And some of the these Arctic explorers chronicled quite accurately the composition, not just what foods they ate, but in what proportions. When the fur trade was active in Canada, run by the French Canadians and then taken over by Hudson's Bay Company. And their primary food was high fat, low carb, in the form of a traditional food called pemmican. And there's a bar of bacon pemmican. 60% dried meat and 40% fat. That's delicious. This is a diary of an American uh, army officer who went uh, into the Arctic looking for a lost uh, Royal Navy a British expedition trying to find the Northwest Passage. And he traveled uh, 3,000 miles on foot and by dog sled over the course of 13 months in the company of two Inuit families. And one of the intriguing things in this diary is he reports that for the first two weeks when he went onto the native diet, he felt like he didn't have energy and couldn't travel. He says, but this passes away within two to three weeks, after which prodigious sledge journeys are possible. Now that's important because a hundred years later when I did my uh, PhD dissertation work on bicycle racers on a, on a similar very high fat, low carbohydrate, moderate protein diet, that was my primary conclusion. And I thought it was original. And then I'm digging, while I'm writing my thesis, I'm digging around in my dad's library looking for something interesting. I was not looking for this. And I came upon this and I said, heck, I've been scooped by a guy a hundred years ago. <laughs> Most people train about twice as many hours as I do. The philosophy that I follow is I want to be faster and fitter in every subsequent workout. So if my numbers, my speed, my pace doesn't go up, um, I usually take more days off. Uh, and I, I would say most traditional endurance athletes train six months harder and harder and harder, get more and more tired. And then they hope after 
a three-week tapering period, they get themselves out of the hole and perform very well in the race. My approach is to get faster every week. The older professional athletes who struggle with either injury, who struggle with tendency for weight gain, uh, who struggle with being able to maintain the intensity of focus that they have to to perform, uh, all of those things tend to improve when they get onto a well-formulated ketogenic diet. We know a number of athletes who have, uh, again, added three, four, five years to their careers. And if an athlete's getting paid many millions of dollars per year, uh, that means a lot of money to those people and to their teams. Bruce Ford asked me, I got onto carbohydrates and encouraged to eat and clearly they helped him for three or four years, and then I felt, think they started having negative consequences. And I think his career was shortened because of the high carbohydrate diet that he was taking. As I got older, particularly in my 40s, I found that I was putting on weight each year. And so my response to that would always be exactly what most marathon runners would be, is that you're just being lazy, train harder. So I'd run harder, uh, try and do more quality, and apart from the fact that as you get older, that means you're going to break down with more injuries, I was finding that I wasn't getting the results. Nothing was happening. And so eventually, and extremely reluctantly, I had to admit to myself that the answer was not going to lie in training more and running more because I couldn't. The answer surely had to be with what I was eating. And so my own personal private step was I just took the first small step of giving up sugar and the results were instantaneous. I started to lose weight immediately. My running improved immediately and then I became super excited about that. So started to explore what happens if I leave out other what I could call junk carbohydrates like bread and pasta and so many of the grains and things like that. Again, the results were immediate. I mean, just catastrophic that happened so quickly and what motivated me was not necessarily my health in any way but just looking at the stopwatch and seeing my times improving so my comrades time went from a very sluggish uh, battling nine hours 48 in the space of 18 months to seven and a half hours um, and then of course we start to get feedback and realize that uh, the way to go is not the way we've been doing it in the past, but actually to be quite radical and to do almost the reverse of what your doctor would tell you to do. And the results are unbelievable. I've been associated with one particular world-class athlete to be the oldest man in the world to swim the English Channel, and that's Dr. Otto Tanning. I was a, a competitive sprinting um, swimmer you know, when I was in my 20s. Um, obviously, doing medicine, there wasn't much time to do the type of training that uh, would be required. But I always kept my swimming alive because I am a great believer in the advantage of swimming over other sports um, in that it is non-weight bearing. And I did the English Channel for the first time in 1994, which is almost exactly 20 years ago uh, to the second time, which was this more recent swim. The purpose of this talk is to share my personal experiences on preparing for a channel swim. The preparation for the English Channel swim, this has been uh, much more of an intensive program. We started two years ago uh, when he was 107 kilograms eating a conventional Western carbohydrate-based diet. Uh, I introduced him to a low-carbohydrate Mediterranean-style diet based on the Spanish ketogenic Mediterranean diet principle. Being in the medical field and also in particular in the cardiac side, I was very interested and am interested in the concept of active aging. And that obviously led me on to this concept of um, fat adaptation. We chose the route of providing his fat energy source as a medium chain triglyceride and coconut cream, coconut oil uh, was the fundamental base for this and he trained with us, he ate it and it proved in the end to be extremely successful as an energy source for his 12 hour channel crossing. 
Unfortunately, I lost a lot of weight during that period and uh, that started to worry me because obviously you do need to carry a certain amount of body fat as insulation if you want to swim in cold water for a long time. So I moderated the, the diet to include carbohydrates but on a very low level. And in the last six months I've been using a, a diet which is about f content of be between 50 and 70 grams of carbohydrate a day, which is low-ish. It's not very low, but it's low-ish. And that worked very well for me um, in terms of the swim. Having interviewed Otto for many hours since his swim, one of the striking success stories was that he had no discomfort at any stage during his 12-hour uh, swim. There was no sign that he had any muscle fatigue or delayed onset muscle soreness in the first 24-48 hours after his swim. And in fact his comments were quite remarkable that when he got out of the water he felt absolutely fantastic. Now that is an unusual observation in an endurance athlete, let alone an endurance athlete who's 73 years old. In previous life, I launched an isotonic sports drink into the Irish market. It came straight in at number two next to this. I'm proud of the product. No, I'm not. Sports drinks and goos I have an absolute aversion to because of the, the carbohydrate content and the, the marketing associated with this type of product. These isotonic sports drinks have been outed as nothing more than sugared water. So you say to me sports drinks have just as much sugar as Coke. That disturbs me. Sports drinks have got a pretty free ride on this because they're so associated with something healthful, which is participation sport. And I have to assume that there is some benefit to an athlete to drink a Gatorade. There's a science coming into all of this, and the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Now, I I don't know, you know, I talked about leucosate and isotonic and electrolytes and all this kind of stuff. They're trying to bamboozle us with science. Gatorade enjoyed uh, immunity uh, above all the others because of their so-called scientific origins. Um, you know the story. It's, it's widely known that uh, uh, the Gators were struggling and at halftime this so-called scientist had developed this drink, this powerful energy drink, which he gave to the players and uh, allegedly they marched out uh, onto the field in the second half and broke the game wide open and from that point on it became known as Gator Aid for the Gators, uh, helping them win that game. Um, y you know, but it's, uh, it, it, it's pretty commonly known now that uh, the orange and green drinks are, are, are full of sugar and uh, uh, the electrolytes and the, and the critical nutrients in these drinks are, are minimal. The athletes know the game. The athletes know there's a big game out there that if you become a famous sports star, the advertisers will come running, waving checkbooks at you. I go back to Jerry Maguire and, and, and the, uh, you know, the underlying tone of that movie was, you know, show me the money. Show me the money. Show me the money! <laughs> These athletes could have a two-year career, they could have a ten-year career. It's unknown. So, is it wrong to endorse a sugary drink? I think, you know, fundamentally, they're at odds with that. And I think it's becoming more and more known that these things don't necessarily benefit. I doubt that sports or music or other stars actually eat and drink the foods that they endorse. All this processed sugar, all this corn syrup, all these additives that are going in, it's, it's, it, it, it's poison. And I always notice is when I go into the gym, people are working really hard and they're still fat. And, you know, I see fat guys at mountain bike races going really fast. So they're good athletes. They're well trained. Why are they still fat? And, and I think the reason is because this diet is just so poisonous. 
The rates of childhood obesity, for instance, are, are horrendous. And if we can use athletes as role models for, uh, for these kids to reduce the amount of sugar and the amount of carbohydrate, that they, the empty calories that they have and encourage them towards a, uh, a healthier, higher fat diet, then we're going to make a huge impact on the health of Western society. Personally, I'd like to see a warning on sports drinks, on sodas, on Coca-Cola and on various things like that so that the children and the parents that are buying these understand the implications of putting sugar and the amount of sugars into their kids' system. They need something. They might get it. They have got it. Right spot, right time, right man. Andy Moran. Okay, now for Dr. Finney's secret drink. Certainly one can have sports drinks. In fact, I invented one for my own use, and my daughter's soccer team used it for six years. Um, and that was basically English black tea, which is sweetened with xylitol. So there's no sugar in it, nothing that raises insulin. And when we took away the, the fruit and, and fruit juices at halftime and gave them this tea, uh, they played solidly through the second half. In April, I ran the two oceans, 56 k's on water the whole way. No sports drinks, no gels? No gels, no sports drinks. Uh, and I astonished my friends, strong all the way. Water is the perfect sports drink. That's all you need. I think you do need salt if you're going to be sweating a lot. But we like make our own drinks. We put salt in the water and you could drink that and be totally fine. Yeah, my, my main sports drink when I'm racing is um, tap water and table salt. And if I go for a four-hour bike ride, five-hour bike ride, it's just tap water. Finally, I think people are starting to realise the contribution that uh, that Steve has made, and, and and many of his colleagues, Jeff Volick and others. To, uh, to the research and to our knowledge, our understanding of how carbohydrates are so detrimental and how it's perfectly okay to compete uh, at a very high level on a low-carb, high-fat diet. Um, since the mid-1980s, uh, I think the general attitude of the mainstream, and many of these are colleagues and people I know well, um, has been to just ignore what we published because it contravenes the existing dogma. Uh, how does that make you feel? Oh, grumpy. The, I pay great deference to, to Steve and amazed that he is so placid and calm, having been abused for so long. Ansel Keys at, from the University of Minnesota was one of the first ones to concluded that saturated fat is bad for you. And it now appears that he came to that conclusion without any significant real data backing it up other than presumption. Um, and perhaps picking and choosing which data he wanted to present. But I actually met Ansel Keys when I came to the University of Minnesota in the mid-1980s as a faculty member. He was semi-retired. He was in his late 80s at the time, but he was still coming to the university to teach. And I had a number of discussions with him about the cholesterol and saturated fat issues. And he told me that he was frustrated because he realized that some of those really weren't standing the test of time. He reached into his briefcase and took out a manuscript. He said, look at this manuscript. It's been refused by the New England Journal, JAMA, Archives of Internal Medicine. He said, in here I show that yes, HDL cholesterol, which is a good cholesterol, is a predictor of when, whether people are going to have heart attack. But it's not a predictor of how long they live. That there's no difference in mortality between the high HDL and the low HDL groups 30 years later. They both have the same mortality. It's just the ones with the highest DL had fewer heart attacks and died of other causes instead. He said, I can't get this paper published. And he was furious. This is it. This is it. That's not California. That's Hawaii. Oh my God. This is our final morning. We are arriving to Honolulu. We've been waiting for the trade winds for 45 days. And here's, what, what do we have? We have a tailwind. Tailwind. Three miles from the finish. So the last hour is going to be tailwind.
is clearly the greatest example of fat adaptation in an athlete, strictly based on the intensity and duration. Uh, as, as Sami said, two marathons a day for 45 days straight. Uh, and the fact that their finishing sprint was two days of 80 miles each day for the last two days. None of the other four-person crews went more than 71 miles in any 24-hour block. And they did two compelling sprints back to back. I mean, that's truly amazing. It was pretty surprising because we thought that we'd have crazy cravings for like cupcakes and carrot cake. Um, but during the row, we didn't really have any food cravings, except for we wished what we were eating was fresh, but it was all dehydrated. I am a giant fan of dark chocolate. Unsweetened, 100% dark chocolate. But I think partially because I was seasick a little bit during the first seven or eight days and I was eating a lot of chocolate during that time. Um, I just couldn't, basically couldn't eat dark chocolate for the rest of the trip. And then another thing, I think I overdosed on nuts. Uh, towards the end, I started throwing probably half of my nuts out, and I added olive oil and coconut butter, which was much more digestible for me. I was probably consuming 5,000 calories a day, but I was like on top of it. Yeah, Meredith's performance was remarkable. A, she did not lose a single pound that she very diligently, as she said, forced herself to eat. So, you know, she was very numbers-oriented in terms of maintaining her energy balance. But the diet gave her the opportunity to do that. Like, I really was set on, I want to keep my body, like, really healthy. I want to come back and be able to go running and not have any issues with weight gain or cravings or any of that stuff. You know, if you look at the um, actual record of their speed, when she was rowing by herself, they were making good speed. I mean, she didn't come along as a passenger. She was a very significant pillar of that team. What's happening here is Dr. Inkinen is going to measure his uh, blood ketones. So this is what goes first. Ow. Oh! <laughs> what your concern was you didn't know if you were eating enough fat if you're, and you thought that your calories might be too low. Mm -hmm. And that might lead you to burn muscle protein. Yeah. And you noticed some of your leg muscles in particular were shrinking. Mm -hmm. The striking thing was that the enzymes that indicate muscle damage, mm -hmm. that when, when the muscle cell is damaged, they leak into the bloodstream, mm -hmm. those were completely normal. Uh, and that was a surprise. In marathon runners, for instance, at, even days after a marathon, you'll see marked elevations of, of these because the muscles have been damaged and the body is breaking down the damaged cells and building new ones. You gave up some muscle because those are muscles we weren't using, the biking muscles and the running muscles. Um, but that basically was, was used to support the muscles you had to have for the rowing. So you redistributed that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was, clearly was no evidence of damage. I mean, it sets a completely different standard for what we can expect from uh, diets to support uh, ultra-endurance athletes. The athletes aren't waiting around. They're going to find their own answers, and so are the general public. Yeah, the science is coming. Every week there are, uh, there are new scientific articles out there. But the horse is bolted as far as the athletes are concerned, you know, because they know the benefits. The traditional medical world is terrified by this new approach because it means that everything that they have been taught is wrong. And I know that people will say, well, Bruce, you're an exceptional athlete and yours is an anecdotal incident, but I'm finding that too many of these anecdotes now. So suddenly the anecdotes are becoming a statistic. I'm very excited now because I think we've gotten away from the idea that there's one perfect diet for everyone. And so I think we are finally coming to comprehend that different people have different needs. The future of performance foods is going to be eating real, whole, recognizable foods. I'm definitely going to continue to run on fat. Uh, my long-term health is the most important thing to me, and you know my endurance sports results are <laughs> improving, so why would I go back to performing at a slightly lower level? Mm -hmm.